Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Rusk and I'm a dermatology resident at University of Cincinnati. Today, as part of the Pediatric Board Review Series, I'm going to be talking about some dermatology related things you might see. There's a lot to go over, but we'll go um, through each of these topics. Because of the short amount of time, this uh, talk is going to be more superficially covering these things with a focus on photos and morphology. So we will get started with newborn skin. First, we'll talk about a nevus simplex. This is also called a stork bite or angel's kiss. This is a transient vascular ectasia of the capillary bed, and most of these fade within one to two years. For those that don't fade, it can be treated with PDL. So that's in comparison to a port wine birthmark, which is a true congenital capillary malformation. These present as pink to red to purple homogeneous patches. Over time, the color can deepen, which is what it gives the lesion its name. We treat these with a pulse dye laser that targets hemoglobin. And here are a few examples of these. So again, these are light pink to red to purple. They're very homogeneous. They're smooth, um, single color patches. A capillary malformation, especially on the face, should prompt evaluation for underlying disorders, including Sturge-Weber syndrome. This is um, a syndrome due to an activating mutation in GNAC, and the distribution of the capillary malformation can give you a clue to this. The highest risk is a V1 distribution, especially if bilateral, as seen in this picture. A clue to the V1 distribution is to look for upper eyelid involvement, and you can see in this patient both upper eyelids are involved. The syndrome is uh, associated with ocular abnormalities and leptomeningeal angiomatosis. So a concerning capillary malformation should prompt workup with appropriate imaging and referrals, especially to ophthalmology. Next, we'll talk about newborn pustular eruptions. There are typically two that are grouped together. On the left, we have erythema toxicum neonatorum, which manifests as delicate pustules on a background of erythema. On the right, we have transient neonatal pustular melanosis, which has three different stages of morphologies, including delicate pustules, which rupture to form crusts or collarettes of scale, and then leave hyperpigmented macules. Um, as you can see in this picture here, all three are present. So you can do a right stain of the fluid within these pustules, and erythema toxicum neonatorum, you will see eosinophils, so luckily they both start with the letter E. And transient neonatal pustular melanosis, you will see neutrophil. So again, the letter N is present there to help us. If there is concern for infection, you can do a gram stain. Of course, um, you will not see bacteria. Impetigo can present in the neonatal per period as well. Classically, we think of that nice honey-colored crusting, which you can see here on this patient. And this is commonly caused by staph or group A strep, which is in the very most superficial part of the epidermis. So next we'll talk about acne. And acne can be broken down into comedonal or inflammatory morphologies, with many patients having features of both. So comedonal refers to whiteheads or closed comedones, and blackheads are open comedones, as we can see here on the patient on the left. Inflammatory refers to those red papules and pustules that we can see in this patient on the right. Pediatricians should be able to get some first-line treatments started for these patients, especially topical therapy. For inflammatory lesions, we use things like benzoyl peroxide and topical antibiotics, in particular clindamycin. If you're going to use a topical antibiotic, always combine it with benzoyl peroxide to prevent resistance. For comedonal and inflammatory lesions, we use topical retinoids, things like adapalene and tretinoin. And then as things become more moderate to severe, you can add an oral therapy like tetracyclines. Most commonly, we use doxycycline or minocycline. And this is a nice table um, talking through how to treat by morphology or severity, so things to try first, including topical retinoids, then adding in benzoyl peroxide, topical antibiotics, and then oral therapy with antibiotics or hormonal therapy if they're female. Next, we'll talk about atopic dermatitis. 
So history, morphology, and distribution are really key to distinguishing atopic dermatitis from other external contact dermatitis. A good clue is the presence of the atopic triads of dermatitis, asthma, and allergic rhinitis. While severity and distribution can be variable, uh, classically atopic dermatitis pre presents in intertriginous sites like the crease of the elbows or behind the knees. It also tends to cluster around the ankles or wrists. Um, lesions can range from being very thin and pink and scaly, like this patient on the right, to thicker, violaceous, like kinified plaques, like the patient on the left. And we can see, too, on the patient on the right, the presence of excoriations, which just shows how itchy that this can be. Several things can worsen eczema or even cause flares, including irritants, heat, dryness, and trauma. Treatment is focused on keeping the skin well hydrated with a thick emollient. In dermatology, we love Vaseline or Aquaphor or even coconut oil. Thicker creams can also be used, um, but we definitely prefer ointments if possible. When flared, we do have to treat the inflammation with a topical steroid and or topical calcineurin inhibitor like tacrolimus or pimicrolimus. And it's important to monitor and treat for any super infections. So these kids are prone to recurrent infections. Commonly, um, they again become impetigenized or super infected with staph or strep. As you can see on the left, you'll start to see that honey-colored crusting again. Eczema herpeticum is also an important super infection that the kids uh, with dermatitis can get. So this is an infection with herpes simplex one or two causes painful monomorphic punched out ulcers and crusting within the previous dermatitic areas. It can be due to primary infection with herpes obtained from a close contact or from auto inoculation. And these crusted lesions can also be super infected with bacteria. It is very important to swab these kids and send for HSV 1, 2 PCR. And it's really important to get the base of the lesion. So sometimes we even have to remove some of the superficial crust to make sure we're swabbing the base to get those infected keratinocytes. This is typically treated with systemic acyclovir, often IV due to the seriousness of the condition. And it's important to involve ENT or ophthalmology if lesions are located near the nose, eyes, or ear. So here are just some more examples of eczema herpeticum. Again, you can see these very monomorphic punched out lesions with a little bit of crusting, especially in that top left photo. Um, it basically looks like someone took a little punch biopsy and just did a bunch of little punches. That's how monomorphic it can be. So that segues us into the infectious disease dermatology realm. And an important one is staph scalded skin syndrome. So this occurs when staph aureus produces epidermolytic toxins that target desmoglein 1 within the skin. Desmoglein 1 is what holds together the keratinocytes and it's present in the most superficial part of the epidermis. So there's a different desmoglein that is unaffected deeper in the epidermis. Um, breakdown leads to very superficial fragile bola that sometimes just looks like peeling. And a good clue to this is perioral fissuring that you can see in this patient. So that area around the mouth is fissuring and very superficially peeling. So here are some more photos of staph scalded skin syndrome. Again, very superficial desquamation or almost just the appearance of peeling. We see this commonly in the neck or intertriginous sites as friction causes that skin to peel off. But again, perioral fissuring is a great clue for this. And I just want to do a little aside of epidermal splits um, because, of course, a split can occur at any level within the epidermis. Um, on the left, we have staph scalded skin. So again, this is very superficial due to desmoglein 1. There is still epidermis underneath this split. In conditions like SJS or TEN that we'll talk about later, you do get full thickness epidermal apoptosis and split and breakdown. So you get sloughing really the entire epidermis and you can see how raw the dermis is underneath. There is no epidermis under there left. Um, a good clue is in darker skin types, you will see loss of pigment, which tells you that really you're under the epidermis at that point.
Next is papular urticaria. This is just a hypersensitivity reaction commonly to insect bites. It manifests as crops of pink papules that tend to be on exposed skin like the distal extremities, neck and face. Also tends to be seasonal in the spring and summer when kids are outside getting bit by insects. And now we'll talk about scabies. Um, and here are a couple examples of those nice burrows that we talk about. So between the fingers, you get this linear scaling papule. And um, on the right, you can even see a little mite here at the top end of it where the burrow ends. Scabies are an ectoparasitic infection by the mite Sarcoptes scabii. It's spread via skin-to-skin -skin contact more so than infected fomites like bedding or clothing. The average number of mites on an individual is low, and this makes getting a positive mineral oil prep on the skin scraping pretty difficult. Classically, we think of burrows in the skin like we saw in the previous slide. We can also see larger nodules or in infants, they get this papulopustular eruption on the hands and feet. These kids are super itchy and the paritis can be way out of proportion of what you're seeing on exam, which is a great clue to start thinking about this. We treat um, with several different things, but most commonly we use permethrin cream and oral ivermectin, both of which need a second dose uh, one to two weeks after the first. So here are some more examples of different morphology. So again, we saw those burrows there on the hands or intertriginous sites in the top right. Um, these children can also get just non-specific papules and nodules, and then they can get acral papulopustules as well, as you can see on the bottom right. Next, we'll talk about pityriasis versicolor. You may also see this called tinea versicolor. This is a super common asymptomatic eruption. It's due to malassezia yeast. It does favor the upper trunk and face. It can be hypopigmented to pink to hyperpigmented. Um, as you can see, different examples here. There should always be a very fine scale. Sometimes you have to scrape a little bit, um, but this eruption will scale. Tinea corporis, or ringworm, is a fungal infection caused by dermatophyte species trichophyton. It presents on the skin as annular scaly red plaques. And when on the skin or tinea corpus, we can use topical treatments. So terbinafine cream or topical azoles are sufficient. Commonly, tinea corpus can be confused for granuloma annulari. So on the left, we see an, another example of tinea corpus. So again, these are annular. They're very scaly. You see texture change on the skin. The right, granuloma annulari, these are smooth. They, they're more um, small papules forming a ring and there is no surface change, no scale here. Next is molluscum contagiosum. This is an infection with the DNA pox virus. It presents as firm, pink, centrally umbilicated papules. They might be linear due to auto inoculation, as you can see in the bottom photo. Several different ways to treat and try to wake the immune system up. Um, are available, but they're not always necessary as this will go away spontaneously. So usually we can just reassure and monitor. Um, if the parents do really want to treat, you can do things like cryotherapy, curatage, or cantheridin. So next we'll talk about hair loss. So we'll start with alopecia areata. Um, this is a T lymphocytic mediated autoimmune disorder of the hair follicle. So classically, these kids will get one or maybe a few well-defined patches of complete hair loss. So there is no rash under the scalp. There are no bumps or scale. This is just smooth hair loss and patches. This can progress to alopecia totalis, where the entire scalp is involved, or alopecia universalis, where you get body hair, eyelashes, eyebrows involved as well. Tinea capitis is the dermatophyte infection of the hair follicle. You'll get patchy hair loss with a scaly scalp and broken hairs. A lot of the time, these kids will have occipital lymphadenopathy, which can be a great clue. Um, and unlike tinea corporis, which we already talked about, these kids need systemic therapy. So we do oral terbinafine, oral, gris oral griseofulvin. Both of these are safe. You do not have to do any routine labs. 
Um, it is important to note that LexiComp is wrong on the dosing. So for griseofaldin, for micro griseofaldin, you need 20 to 25 milligrams per keg, where ultra micro is 10 to 15 mg per keg. Um, when there's an acute inflammatory reaction to tinea capitis, these kids can develop a carry-on. This is a boggy inflamed plaque. It can be studded with pustules and broken hair. So this is a very extreme inflammatory reaction to the dermatophyte organisms. Trichotillomania is um, due to recurrent pulling of the hair. Um, you can get a patch of alopecia. The good clue is that hair shafts are at different lengths here so as they're pulling it out the hair begins to grow some pieces are too short to grab and so as we can see here hair tends to grow in at different lengths and finally telogen effluvium this is a non-scarring alopecia this is describes excessive shedding of the entire scalp um, due to a bunch of hairs that are prematurely shifted into telogen at once. So there is some sort of trigger with our, that's a systemic illness, a medication, high stress or hormonal changes that shifts too many hairs into telogen. And then several months later, you get the shedding of those hairs. It is important to know that new hairs are coming in behind it. Um, this is not a scarring process as long as the trigger is removed. Okay, so now we'll talk about neurocutaneous syndromes. There are just a few here in dermatology. First is neurofibromatosis type 1, and of course there's all these criteria we have to know. In dermatology, the important one are the presence of these cafe au lait macules, so you need six or more of them. If the patient is prepubertal, they must be over half a centimeter. If they're postpubertal, they need to be over one and a half centimeters. These patients also get axillary freckling, leash nodules, they need two or more to meet criteria, some sort of osseous lesion, whether that's sinoid dysplasia or thinning of the long bone cortex, and then of course neurofibromas, so two or more regular neurofibromas or one or more plexiform neurofibroma. Optic gliomas and first degree relatives with neurofibromatosis are also part of the criteria. And here are some examples of those. So on the top right, you see those, that axillary freckling, those few millimeter TN macules within the axilla. Um, on the middle to the left, you'll see some cafe au lait macules, so a larger one on the abdomen in there, but a few smaller ones on the chest. And then a photo of neurofibromas on the bottom right, these soft pedunculated skin color to tan papules. Um, this is the timeline that has summarized the age at with which different features present. Cafe au lait macules are typically the first thing to present, followed by axillary freckling. Of note, neurofibromas really don't present until puberty, so they come a little bit later. Next is tuberous sclerosis. This is due to mutations in Hamerton and tuberin genes that lead to hamartomas in almost every organ. The earliest sign of tuberous sclerosis may be hypopigmented macules like ash leaf spots. Um, multiple of these lesions should prompt further workup if you see these. And on the photo here, we can see these hypopigmented macules um, that are the ash leaf macules. Some more um, dermatologic manifestations of tuberous sclerosis. So this picture on the left here is a picture of a chagrin patch, which is a collagenoma. The top right shows multiple facial angiofibromas. These cluster typically around the central face, especially around the nose. Another word you might hear um, them called is adenoma sebaceum. And the bottom right is a periungual angiofibroma. So we'll just briefly talk about melanoma. Um, Mainly, I want to recognize the ABCDEs of melanoma, which is a great way to screen for these patients. So A stands for asymmetry. You cannot fold these lesions in half to make them mirror each other. B is for border. So um, we want a nice, smooth, rounded border, and we worry if it's irregular or jagged. Color, typically we think about this meaning multiple colors. So if there's blue, black, pink, brown, all within the same mole, that's a reason to be worried. D is diameter, so something that's over um, five or six millimeters. E is really the most important one though. Um, it's evolution, so something's changing, growing. Um, those are the ones we wanna look at carefully. 
And we have two examples on the right here. Both of them are asymmetric. You cannot fold either of these in half. They have an irregular, somewhat jagged border and lots of color. So pink, tan, black, brown, all within the same lesion. So now we'll just hit this final category of other things to know. This is just a random potpourri of uh, pediatric dermatology that we'll go through. First up are infantile hemangiomas. These present at birth, um, or these can present at birth, but most appear within the first few weeks to months of life. Over about one year, they proliferate and then gradually involute over several more years. Compared to port wine birthmarks, these tend to be brighter red and more patchy. You get superficial telangiectasias. So the color is a little bit uneven. It's not as homogenous as we saw before. And as these involute, they can leave some residual skin changes like scarring or telangiectasias or even atrophy of the skin. Um, we can treat these using oral therapy, commonly propranolol, and reasons to treat these would be ulceration or if they're in a site that's cosmetically sensitive, like the face, the nose, um, things that could be disfiguring, um, or if there's functional impairment. So we worry about cervical facial or airway involvement or vision impairment if too close to the eye. Um, we can also treat topically with a timolol ophthalmic gel. Um, we'll also talk about erythema multiforme. This is a self-limited hypersensitivity reaction. So commonly we think of the trigger as being herpes. This is a distinct entity from SJSTEN. Classically, we get these target lesions. So three rings of color, an outer darker red, a, a middle paler area, and then another darker red area in the center. And this is the true target, as you can see in the top right. Um, and palmo plantar involvement is a great clue as well, as you can see in this photo. Um, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or toxic, toxic epidermolytic necrolysis. This is a spectrum of multi-system disease due to drug hypersensitivity. The picture you would want to burn into your brain is this one on the top right with that severe crusting around the mouth. Um, so there is severe mucosal involvement. They get hemorrhagic crusting on the lips. Um, it's pretty rare to see SJST and without this degree of systemic involvement. On the skin, you'll see dusky patches. You'll see that full thickness desquamation that we talked about. You can see some of that in the bottom picture here. And again, this is a overlap, a spectrum of disease. So we call it SJS when there's less than 10% body surface area. SJST and overlap when it's 10 to 30% and TEN if it's over 30% BSA. And this is the BSA of desquamating skin. So not just redness or duskiness, but skin that is truly desquamating and, and falling off. Again, this is a drug hypersensitivity, and commonly we think about sulfas, NSAIDs, allopurinol, and anti-epileptics. Um, another related condition is mycoplasma-induced rash and mucositis, or MERM. The mucosal involvement is very similar to SJSTEN, but the cutaneous involvement is usually less severe. So they'll have very impressive mucosa. You want to take a look at the lips. You want to take, take a look at the genital skin. Um, and they may only have a few areas of involvement on the, on the body. Um, these patients might also have cough, fever, and malaise, and we can do a nasopharyngeal swab to try to um, get a positive mycoplasma PCR. We'll just briefly talk about allergic contact dermatitis. So commonly we see this as poison ivy or roost dermatitis. The key to this is that the eruption is pretty linear. You get these linear, intensely pritic vesicles. That's the clue of external, external contact. So something brushed against the skin from outside. And you can see that on this little girl on her right arm there, her right forearm. Um, this is spread by the oil on the plant, not the fluid in the vesicles. So rupturing these vesicles, it does not cause it to spread, um, but you want to make sure you get the oil off of your skin as that can cause it to spread. We'll just briefly talk about ne nevus sebaceous. Despite the word nevus in the name, this is actually a congenital hamartoma. It's most commonly found on the scalp. They're very yellow and waxy appearing, and they're alopecic, so there's no hair follicles within them. They do not have to be removed, but if they are large or if the family is concerned about the cosmetic aspect of it, we can take them 
we can take them off. Typically, we like to wait until the child can tolerate local anesthesia. Next is psoriasis. Again, we'll just briefly talk about this. Um, these lesions are sharply defined. They're pink to red. Um, they have a thick silvery adherent scale on them, and it's really important to ask these patients about signs or symptoms of psoriatic arthritis, as that needs to be treated differently. Pediasis rosea, it's more common in teens and presents initially as a single larger what we call herald patch, followed by generalization of smaller scaly papules over several weeks. It does self-resolve over two to three months. It's thought it could be viral as it does come up more in the spring and fall, but we're not entirely sure. They tend to form ovals on the long axis, um, and the long, sorry, and the long axis lines up with the natural skin folds. So on the back, these folds kind of come up and down, and that's what gives us this Christmas tree pattern that we think of when we see it on the back. Um, and just another example here of these oval patches, and they tend to follow the natural skin tension lines. Uh, we'll talk about seborrheic dermatitis. This is an abnormal immune response to pitorosporum yeast that we find on the skin. In infants, it manifests as a self-limited eruption due to persistent maternal androgens. It presents as cradle cap, or it can be a diaper dermatitis. A clue is the presence of the classic greasy yellow scale. Um, but that scale can be harder to appreciate in areas of, uh, with a lot of moisture, like the diaper area. Acrodermatitis enteropathica. This is an autosomal recessive condition where the patients have abnormal zinc absorption due to a transport deficiency across the small intestine. Um, it presents when babies are weaned from breast milk to cow's milk or after about four to 10 weeks in formula fed infants. So typically this presents around the mouth or the diaper area with these crusting scaling plaques. And finally, we have acanthosis nigricans. These are hyperpigmented velvety plaques. Commonly we see it on the neck, but we can see it on the face, on the trunk, and the axilla. And it's just important to know that this is a marker of insulin resistance. And that is it. I'd like to give a shout out to our medical photographer, Caitlin, for helping me gather a lot of these excellent photos. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope this was helpful and best of luck on your exam.